in which an affair unfolds, and we see the damage wrought upon the scorned. Chapter 8 Alexey Alexandrovitch found nothing peculiar or improper in the fact that his wife was sitting at a separate table with Vronsky and having an animated conversation about something. But he noticed that the others in the drawing room had seen something peculiar and improper, and therefore he too found it improper. He decided he ought to say so to his wife. On returning home, Alexey Alexandrovitch went to his study as he usually did, sat in his armchair, opened a book about the papacy at a place marked by a paper knife, and read till one o'clock, as usual, only from time to time he rubbed his high forehead and tossed his head, as if chasing something away. At the usual hour he rose and prepared for bed. Anna Arkadyevna was not home yet. Book under his arm, he went upstairs, but this evening, instead of the usual thoughts and considerations about official matters, his mind was full of his wife and something unpleasant that had happened with her. Contrary to his habit, he did not get into bed, but, clasping his hands behind his back, began pacing up and down the rooms. He could not lie down, feeling that he had first to think over this newly arisen circumstance. When Alexey Alexandrovitch had decided to himself that he ought to have a talk with his wife, it had seemed so easy and simple a thing to him. But now, as he began to think over this newly arisen circumstance, it seemed to him very complicated and difficult. Alexey Alexandrovitch was not a jealous man. Jealousy, in his opinion, was insulting to a wife, and a man ought to have trust in his wife. Why he ought to have trust, that is complete assurance that his young wife would always love him, he never asked himself, but he felt no distrust, because he had trust and told himself that he had to have it. But now, though his conviction that jealousy was a shameful feeling, and that one ought to have trust was not destroyed, he felt that he stood face to face with something illogical and senseless, and he did not know what to do. Alexey Alexandrovitch stood face to face with life, confronting the possibility of his wife loving someone else besides him. And it was this that seemed so senseless and incomprehensible to him, because it was life itself. All his life Alexey Alexandrovitch had lived and worked in spheres of service that dealt with reflections of life, and each time he had encountered life itself he had drawn back from it. Now he experienced a feeling similar to what a man would feel who was calmly walking across a bridge over an abyss, and suddenly saw that the bridge had been taken down, and below him was the bottomless deep. This bottomless deep was life itself, the bridge, the artificial life that Alexey Alexandrovitch had lived. For the first time, questions came to him about the possibility of his wife falling in love with someone, and he was horrified at them. Without undressing, he paced with his even step up and down the resounding parquet floor of the dining room, lit by a single lamp, over the carpet in the dark drawing room, where light was reflected only from the large, recently painted portrait of himself that hung over the sofa, and through her boudoir, where two candles burned, lighting the portraits of her relations and lady friends, and the beautiful knick-knacks on her desk, long intimately familiar to him. Passing through her room, he reached the door of the bedroom and turned back again. 
At each section of his walk, and most often on the parquet of the lamp-lit dining-room, he stopped and said to himself, Yes, it is necessary to resolve this and stop it, to express my view of it and my resolution. And he turned back. But express what? What resolution? He said to himself in the drawing-room and found no answer. But finally, he asked himself, before turning to the boudoir, what has happened? Nothing. She talked with him for a long time. What of it? A woman can talk with all sorts of men in society. And besides, to be jealous means to humiliate both myself and her, he told himself, going into her boudoir. But this reasoning, which used to have such weight for him, now weighed nothing and meant nothing and from the bedroom door he turned back to the main room. But as soon as he entered the dark drawing-room again, some voice said to him that this was not so, that if others had noticed it, it meant there was something. And again he said to himself, in the dining-room, Yes, it is necessary to resolve this, and stop it, and to express my view. And again in the drawing-room, before turning back, he asked himself, Resolve it how? and then asked himself what had happened, and answered nothing, and remembered that jealousy was a feeling humiliating for a wife. But again in the drawing-room he was convinced that something had happened. His thoughts, like his body, completed a full circle without encountering anything new. He noticed it, rubbed his forehead, and sat down in her boudoir. Here, looking at her desk with the malachite blotter and an unfinished letter lying on it, his thoughts suddenly changed. He began thinking about her, about what she thought and felt. For the first time, he vividly pictured to himself her personal life, her thoughts, her wishes, and the thought that she could and should have her own particular life seemed so frightening to him that he hastened to drive it away. It was that bottomless deep into which it was frightening to look. To put himself in thought and feelings into another being was a mental act alien to Alexey Alexandrovitch. He regarded this mental act as harmful and dangerous fantasizing. And most terrible of all, he thought, is that precisely now, when my work is coming to a conclusion, he was thinking of the project he was putting through, when I need all my calm and all my inner forces, this senseless anxiety falls upon me. But what am I to do? I am not one of those people who suffer troubles and anxieties and have no strength to look them in the face. I must think it over, resolve it, cast it aside, he said aloud. Questions about her feelings, about what has been or might be going on in her head, are none of my business. They are the business of her conscience and belong to religion, he said to himself feeling relieved at the awareness that he had found the legitimate category to which the arisen circumstances belonged. And so, Alexey Alexandrovitch said to himself, questions of her feelings and so on, or questions of her conscience, which can be no business of mine. My duty is then clearly defined. As head of the family, I am the person whose duty it is to guide her, and therefore in part the person responsible. I must point out the danger I see, caution her, and even use authority. I must speak out to her. And in Alexey Alexandrovitch's head, everything he would presently say to his wife took clear shape. Thinking over what he would say, he regretted that he had to put his time and mental powers to such inconspicuous domestic use. But in spite of that, the form and sequence of the imminent speech took shape in his head clearly and distinctly, like a report. I must say and speak out the following— First, an explanation of the meaning of public opinion and propriety. Second, a religious explanation of the meaning of marriage. Third, if necessary, an indication of the possible unhappiness for our son. Fourth, an indication of her own unhappiness. And, interlacing his fingers, palms down, Alexey Alexandrovitch stretched so that the joints cracked. This gesture, a bad habit, joining his hands and cracking his fingers, always calmed him down and brought him to precision, which he had such need of now. There was the sound of a carriage driving up by the entrance, 
Alexey Alexandrovitch stopped in the middle of the drawing room. A woman's footsteps came up the stairs. Alexey Alexandrovitch prepared for his speech, stood pressed with his crossed fingers, seeing whether they might be another crack somewhere. One joint cracked. By the sound of light footsteps on the stairs, he could already sense her approach, and though he was pleased with the speech, he felt afraid of the imminent talk. If you enjoy this format, please leave a like and subscribe and return tomorrow for the next chapter.